Okay, I think now's, now's a good time. Now's a good time to start. So, good afternoon, everybody. Many thanks for many thanks for joining us today, and welcome to Canwood's crash course on how to utilise co-management within your organisation. My name is James Churchill. I'm Canwood's head of sales, and joining me today is Daniel Williams, Canwood's head of technology. And over the next forty-five minutes or so, we'll be looking to talk through all things co-management. And as you can see here from the agenda. We'll start off with just a quick recap of what co-management is and how it enables you to attach your existing deployment of Configuration Manager to Microsoft 365 Cloud. We'll look at the components of co-management, focusing on Configuration Manager and Microsoft Intune before talking through associated workloads. Dan will then touch on paths to co-management with regards to installation and setup, focusing on two paths in particular. And then we'll look at the benefits and the value that can be realized utilizing co-management services. We have a, a Camrid customer success story to that point, and we'll be talking through that and the benefits that they're realizing before finishing up and just summarizing everything that we've heard today. We'll then obviously open the floor to any questions. And on, on that point, if you do have any questions at all, please feel free to ask, drop them into the comments box. We'll pick that up and we'll make sure we get those answered at the end for you. So with that, Sit back, enjoy. I'll pass over to Dan now, who will talk you through what co-management is. Thank you. Cool. Thanks very much, James. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Daniel Williams. I'm head of technology at Camwood. I've uh, been in the organisation for probably about a year and a half, two years now. Um, and I lead sort of technology strategy as well as um, sort of most of our engagements with, uh, with our customers as well. So sort of as, as James alluded to, we're going to kick off initially around um, what is co-management and ultimately sort of what it means for a lot of organisations. So um, the graphic on the right hand side will sort of help you conceptually sort of picture what it looks like um, for existing people that have got Config Manager and ultimately who, um, who are looking to adopt um, Intune and sort of SCCM co-management associated workloads. Um, so long and short of it, um, co-management effectively is an integration between your on-premises Config Manager uh, and ultimately, what is Microsoft Intune or, or uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, as it's otherwise known as from a control plane perspective. Um, and what this sort of really helps organizations do is um, integrate their existing investments um, and existing infrastructure within SECM um, and ultimately just align that to what is sort of cloud management and ultimately everything that's associated to it. So ultimately, you're you're talking about things associated to you know, device configuration, um, anything sort of aligned to compliances, endpoint protection, those sorts of things effectively. Um, and, and ultimately, it's, it's a really powerful solution because it allows the flexibility of, you know, still utilizing your existing SCCM infrastructure. I think someone accidentally muted me. Um, so for those of you who sort of don't know, when you go through a, a configuration management deployment there, um, Ultimately, what, what you've got is a set of controls and policies that you've got in SCCM world and, and what you're trying to sort of transfer and bridge across into new modern management world um, from that point of view as well. So it's, it's really important to note that when you go through co-management, you start building out the policies and you have full control of what's being turned on and what's not, what's not being turned on from that point of view. Um, and it's also important to note that this won't affect any server infrastructure when you enable code management as well. So if you're using SCCM for patch management or sort of device configuration around the server infrastructure, um, what we're talking about here around the code management piece is all about sort of Windows 10, Windows 11, and you know, potentially Mac operating systems as well. Um, and what it allows you to do is do that sort of coexistence. So you've got sort of three buckets your devices will typically fall into. Um, one being sort of completely config manager owned, which is sort of on-premises infrastructure. Um, then you've got on the flip side of that, completely cloud driven and cloud managed, which is ultimately Microsoft Intune, and where a lot of organizations sort of sit in the middle, uh, which is ultimately the hybrid configuration as well from that point of view. Um, and also, it's important to note because you're we're talking about sort of you controlling the policy sets and before you move into any production usage for config manager and, and uh, co management, you can start with a pilot collection group, so a small set of sub devices that you want to test out. And the policies you're outlining and building out before you sort of release into production as well. Um, so from a component perspective, um, there's there's not a great deal to it in terms of the different components that are aligned to it. And that's it's actually a fairly simplistic config 
um, to get the prerequisites up and running. Um, so what I'll do is I'll start at the top and sort of work our way down. Um, but primarily the, the, underpinning, the underpinning technology associated to this is Azure Active Directory. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Azure Active Directory is a hybrid and a cloud um, authentication uh, mechanism and solution delivery. So very traditional um, on-premises Active Directory. Um, what we've got here is a synchronization and integration between your on-premises domain and your on-premises Active Directory and linking that up to Azure Active Directory as well. Um, the next stage on top of that ultimately is something called Tenant and Attach. Um, and what that is, is building in the integration between your on-prem config manager uh, and what is the hybrid, uh, the hybrid use and the cloud management platform within Endpoint Manager. Quite a simplistic config set, but the most important thing to, to understand is sort of the prerequisite to that is to ensure that your devices are um, Azure Active Directory hybrid joined. Um, and what hybrid join effectively means is that they are enrolled um, through your local domain, so normal on-premises Active Directory, um, but they're also uh, hybrid joined with Azure Active Directory um, through some config changes with AD Sync. Um, so there's not sort of too much to it. Um, effectively, all you need to do is make sure your user accounts are all synchronized and your computer accounts are all synchronized and ensure that you've got the hybrid uh, config join as well enabled. After that, we've got the co-management workloads and the co-management workloads, we've, we've got a bit more uh, a bit more explanation further down through the presentation itself, but ultimately the co-management workflows are associated with the policies um, that you're going to be defining and building out end-to-end. -end. Um, so it can be things like device configuration, device compliance, endpoint protection, resource and access policies. So everything that you would expect to configure through SCCM is built out and delivered through these uh, co-management workloads as well. Um, and then sort of the final stage where, which Microsoft are sort of trying to push organizations towards is a purely cloud native management solution. Um, and there's nothing wrong with having devices in um, pure on-prem management, hybrid management, and some cloud native management as well. Um, so they won't, when we talk about cloud native management, we're talking about no uh, ties back into on-premises infrastructure at all. Um, all of their device management, all of their operations are delivered through end-to-end um, -end, uh, cloud, cloud native management console perspectives. Um, so from a workloads perspective, um, again, sort of the right-hand side image is probably a good understanding of where these things sit and ultimately what the, the rip and replace of the SCCM model is. Um, like I said, there are three stages to these workloads configurations and Microsoft quite nicely um, built out the configuration sets within SCCM using a slider. Um, and the slider effectively says uh, nothing set to pilot group, which is targeting that limited collection of those pilot users. And then you've got a slider set to all, and that's when it would flip across to production users entirely. And um, so sort of three stages of implementation of completely off pilot sets of users uh, and everyone in production as well. And um, so when we're talking about workloads, we're really talking about sort of these, these things down here on the left-hand side, and they all, they're all underpinned by compliance policies. So when we talk about compliance policies, we're really sort of talking about how can we ensure these devices are meeting the business requirements and the organizational requirements around operating system version, endpoint protection, security, config, bit locker, everything sort of associated to it. And a lot of the time organizations, if they're using SCCM, don't necessarily make use of the compliance policies available out of the box. So as soon as you switch over the workload configuration to pilot at all, um, that's when Intune starts delivering um, all, of these, all of these policies on the left-hand side here. So really what we see with organizations when they build out compliance policies from scratch, they want to ensure that things like uh, BitLockers enabled, they've got antivirus enabled, Windows firewalls enabled, the right, uh, the right ports and the right sort of access policies enabled to it. And then off the back of that, you can actually make sort of two decisions to say, we'll have a reporting and an auditing mode to say, if these devices don't meet these compliance policies, we will alert report on it and you can pass that over to the service desk to pick up and remediate. Or alternatively, you can take a hard action to either sort of block that device from the infrastructure entirely until they meet these prerequisites. For example, they may need to have the latest Windows updates installed. They may need to ensure that they've got relevant, um, relevant antivirus and sort of protection software built into the platform before they can start accessing data within your infrastructure itself. Uh, Windows update policies are quite sort of straightforward and very, very similar to how um, SCCM sort of traditionally works. So within SCCM, you have things like ADRs and sort of device groups. Um, as soon as you make the flip over to code management and ultimately what will be in tune, um, you do everything associated to um, update rings. And the update rings are very sort of similar in, in how they sort of work in SCCM world. 
you set a target device, you set sort of policies around the dates and the times that need to be installed. You can set deferral policies to say you can deny um, deny these updates until a particular amount of time. You can force through zero update policies. So if there's a, a vulnerability that's come through, you can force through particular updates to fix those vulnerabilities. Um, and at the same time, it you know, works very similar to Software Center where an end user will get a nagging box in the bottom right-hand corner and they can only postpone it so, so many amount of times before it has to install. So it works very similar um, in terms of how SCCM configures it. Ultimately, the, the massive benefit behind Intune delivering the Windows updates associated to co-management is it's not reliant in connections back to the infrastructure any way, shape or form. Um, it's all delivered by Intune across the end user's internet connection. Um, and if you've got a situation where users are, you know, they're hybrid workers, so they're working between um, their, their home office, um, as well as actually being in a corporate office, you can use something called delivery optimization, which is very similar to peer-to-peer -peer caching. So instead of having all of those users hitting Microsoft and pulling, pulling the updates um, across the internet, saturating the bandwidth in an office, um, what happens is you use internal network traffic to deal with that as well. Uh, resource access policies are ultimately everything defined around how users interact with resources within your infrastructure. Um, so it's really sort of straightforward things like um, device access policies like Wi-Fi profiles, mail settings, not associated to Outlook, but if they wanted to use the, the native mail client itself. Um, if you've got um, additional data access policies, network drive maps, those sorts of things, that's where resource access policies come into play. Um, endpoint protection, it's pretty sort of self-explanatory around sort of, you know, has it got antivirus enabled? Uh, what are the settings for that antivirus? Have you got the firewall enabled? What are the settings around that bit locker? What version of bit locker? What level of encryption do they need? Um, on top of that is if you go sort of through the higher SKUs of the Microsoft 365 solution, um, such as E3 and E5, you can make use of next generational sort of endpoint protection around sort of attack surface reduction, um, anomaly detection, um, as well as sort of ongoing and continuous ransomware protection as well. Um, device convig is a very, very big topic and it underpins sort of everything we've talked about so far. Uh, but ultimately it's around the configuration of how the devices need to react um, and how the users can interact with them. So typically what we do with organizations is we start with a baseline and the baseline typically follows Microsoft best practice associated to it. And it's, we utilize something called MDM baseline security policies. Uh, Microsoft tend to release these sort of every 12 months and actually quite recently they just released the November ones. And um, so we start with those and those device config settings utilizing the baselines will be things like, how does Internet Explorer react? Um, do you need ink workspace? Do you need to limit PowerShell commandlets? Um, all sort of plethora of different things. So what we, what we do with a lot of customers, we start with those baseline policies and then we amalgamate and fit in any gaps that the baselines don't specifically fit. So for anyone sort of on this call thinking about how we can get sort of started associated to this, um, really take a look at the MDM baseline policies for November 2021. Um, and then from there, you can build your own customized policies on top of that after that. Um, Office click to run. I think it's quite self-explanatory. I think that the interesting points to call out are um, if you are updating your Office software um, to all your end users sort of manually, you can switch how Office is being updated and delivered to Intune in a very similar way to Windows updates and update rings. Um, so if you utilize the Office CDN network, users will receive updates of Office across the internet rather than yeah, pulling them across the infrastructure from that point of view and using sort of traditional DPs. Um, and then the final one, client apps, again, fairly sort of self-explanatory. Um, whenever you start accessing co-management and Intune as a whole, you get a very sort of similar portal to Software Center um, called the management portal or the co-management portal that end users will get access to. You can either force client apps to arrive on the end user's device itself, or you can make the software available to them. Um, and then in terms of sort of path to co path to code management as a whole, we see sort of two main ones. Um, the other alternative is to do a complete fresh rebuild um, and start from scratch and enroll them that way. But if you're an existing SCCM customer, uh, which I'm guessing the majority of you are, um, and you want to enroll your devices into Intune and co-management and endpoint manager as a whole, um, our recommended path is ultimately the automatic enrollment of your existing clients. Um, so the prerequisites for all of this is the hybrid domain join that we were talking about. So ensuring that you've got AD Connect uh, configured correctly to synchronize your user accounts and computer accounts. And at the same time, ensuring that you have local domain join, which you more than likely will have, 
Um, and then you enable hybrid domain joins so the computers, the computers account and the physical devices are not only enjoined to your local domain, but they're also joined to Azure Active Directory at the same time. Um, so the way that auto-enroll works, it's a configuration setting within SCCM, it's quite straightforward. Um, but what will happen is to ensure enrollment of these devices, any device with an SCCM client um, installation on that device will be automatically enrolled into Intune and they will automatically be pulled into that device. At that point, there is no physical to change the device. The user won't see any disruption or interaction. It's just enrolling that device so you can start moving through those co-management workloads we were talking about. Um, the other alternative is something called bootstrap modern provisioning, and this is sort of really heavily reliant on cloud management gateways. Um, so instead of doing the auto enrollment, this is a little bit more complex and it's a little bit more lengthy, but if an organization didn't want to go through the auto enrollment process and they wanted to stage it a little bit more, um, you would use the cloud management gateway to distribute the enrollment um, of your end devices uh, from end to end. So we work with customers with both. Our recommendation is really take, take full benefit and advantage of the auto enrollment because it's it's simpler, less hands-on, and as devices check in, they just get automatically enrolled into it itself. Um, and sort of the benefits of co-management is everything sort of we, we've really talked about. So what we want to make sure people understand we, we get across when we talk about co-management is that the way the market's moving is, you know, everything's moving to public cloud to get more value out of your investment with things like Microsoft 365. You really need to start adopting things like Windows Defender, Microsoft Intune, Windows Autopilot. And the only way you can realistically start making that logical transition um, rather than just doing a big bang sort of transition is doing that co-management. So uh, Microsoft tend to look at this as a bridge and a destination. So you don't necessarily um, need to end with, with your co-management piece, but you can absolutely leave it in a co-management state. So there's no end of life dates that's been given from SCCM. Microsoft understand there's a lot of investment there. And um, for organizations that want to start transitioning into public cloud and cloud man uh, modern management, um, config manager and ultimately co-management is the way to go. Um, and you get much better granularity and visibility of things like conditional access with device, um, device compliance as a whole. You get remote access through Intune itself. So if you need to hard wipe a device, if a device has been stolen and you need to um, hard wipe it remotely, that can all be done directly out of the Intune and the endpoint management portal. Um, you get much more sort of visibility with device health. Um, so anyone that uses SCCM on, on this call at the moment will probably appreciate that trying to pull out the reports of SCCM is like pulling teeth, um, especially if you don't know what you're doing. So um, Microsoft has simplified that and provided all of that out of the box available to use and consume um, and ultimately allow organizations to make decisions around proactive remediation. So they can see devices that are having problems around boot up times, problem applications, um, are they running out, of, running out of hard disk space? Have they got under spec CPUs and RAM, et cetera? And is it potentially an option to uh, change your user's device altogether? Um, outside of that, things like water, uh, Windows Autopilot are really, really important in terms of how organizations to start sort of traditionally provisioning. So, um, you know, anyone using Config Manager and SCCM on-prem, typically the process is you will have a golden image or multiple golden images, or, or maybe you just take the vanilla SOE that comes out of the box with the vendor. Um, but ultimately, that needs to hit a desk to be built um, and then shipped out to the end user or delivered to the end user in the corporate office. Um, the way that Windows Autopilot works, especially in a config manager perspective and a co-management perspective, is that um, as long as you build out policies typically, um, and ultimately all of the um, all the client apps will be downloaded and built into that user's device. So it's it's taking a lot of the overhead um, away from the associated sort of build and manual build process that's built as part of that as well. Um, and sort of finally, the, the last piece is really powerful for organizations making that co-management piece and transitioning through evergreen IT and Windows as a service, desktop analytics. Um, so desktop analytics is a tool set um, that organizations use to plan migrations from feature update to feature update, or if they're feeling particularly risk, risky, they can, they can go straight to Windows 11. But desktop analytics helps organizations build out plans around which applications are compatible potentially, um, and ultimately which devices can and can't go based on hardware metrics associated to it. Um, and then on to the customer success story. So we, we've got lots of these, but we felt like this is probably one of the more relevant ones because it was a quite recent project that we completed with a customer. Um, so the customer is manufacturing customer, 3,500 3, users. Um, and ultimately they had a modern workplace evolution sort of mandate and 
and approach to everything they wanted to do. So they, they were very sort of traditionally legacy. They utilized their CCM on-prem. Everything was on-prem. They had Microsoft 365 licensing, but they weren't making the most of the investment. Um, and they know they needed to improve how they were delivering support to end users, um, how they were issuing out devices and ultimately improve their um, security posture and the device conflict across the board. So um, like I said, they had SCCM and they, they kind of didn't know where to start with all of this. Um, so it was really a case of figuring out what their success criteria is, what their, their golden utopia of what their device management needed to look like. Um, and ultimately what that needed to look like from an end-to-end -end perspective is start enabling and start utilizing some of the more cloud native technologies like device compliance and um, endpoint protection policies, resource access policies, um, some of the anomaly detection that's built into some of the higher Microsoft 365 SKUs and um, improve how they were updating operating systems and how they were updating Office end-to-end -end, um, and ultimately just making their lives a lot easier from a support desk, support desk perspective. So, um, you know, from a service desk perspective, immediately as soon as we started enabling uh, co-management and giving them visibility of their client estate from a single, simple to use, really straightforward dashboard, they were act actually able to start applying proactive remediation to the devices and applications rather than just waiting for um, end users to call the help desk and say, hey, my device isn't reacting properly. Can you do something about it? So all in all, we looked at an initial reduction of about 40% associated to the help desk and the service desk, which is a massive, massive improvement to the service desk staff. Um, and the L2 and the L3 teams were ultimately spending their time doing uh, more and more beneficial things and more innovative things for the organization as a whole. Um, so ultimately, it was, a, it was a case of, you know, we needed to move them across to um, Intune through the co-management route, um, as well as still managing some of their server infrastructure with SECM. Um, they utilized then BAM on-prem, um, but they wanted to transition away from that and store uh, the BitLocker keys within Azure Active Directory. Um, and they wanted a much simpler and seamless white glove service when it came into device provisioning. So they've now got... Um, got a link in with um, Dell and HP. So whenever they order a device, it gets uploaded into their portal. Um, the end user gets the device, unboxes it, logs in and pulls all the device configuration all over their uh, core line of business apps to ensure that they're, they're, they're ready to roll as quickly as possible. And that, that cut down sort of service delivery and, and build time by up to about 50, 60% because they were shipping devices all over the globe. And if you've got a central hub, that can be an absolute nightmare, um, especially from remote config as well. Um, so all in, it was a real sort of positive approach. You know, they, they recognized initial savings straight off the bat from a support desk perspective. Um, the network team were very pleased because, because they were in a hybrid working model and they were trying to deliver feature updates across the throttle VPN. End users wouldn't really get the feature updates and then they'd reboot the device and have to start over again. So it came into a really sort of bad, horrible cycle of just trying to download updates onto a device. Um, and now, you know, removing that and delivering the updates through Intune We've removed the, the throttle uh, and ultimately sort of the, the network saturation we had there associated to all the users uh, and through the through the VPN effectively. Um, so ultimately, in summary, I think what we're what we're trying to explain is sort of show customers and, and show everyone when we when we talk about co-management is, is something that organizations need to start looking at now, even if it's a case of right, we haven't got a, uh, a modern management or a cloud management system ready to roll uh, and we haven't got a mandate from the business it's a really simplistic configuration to get you moving in the right direction and the joy of ultimately is you don't need to do a big bang you don't need to affect um, existing devices out there you can do a pilot workload transition you can try out some different policy settings you can try out the baseline settings that i mentioned before uh, and ultimately just just build out what you need from a device compliance perspective slowly but surely uh, but ensuring you've got the, the relevant benchmark and baselines in there uh, to kick off with. But I think one of, the, one of the interesting points, and again, I sort of mentioned it a little bit earlier, is a chap called Brad Anderson, who used to work at Microsoft. He was uh, one of the lead program managers for, for Microsoft 365 and ultimately Endpoint Manager. Um, I don't know if he's actually gone across to Qualtrics now, but he was sort of really spearheading the co-management of the Microsoft 365 side of things. Um, and his quote, ultimately, and he got a lot of questions around this, and it kept sort of coming up again and again and again. Um, I get asked a lot if co-management is a bridge between on-prem and the cloud, or if it is a destination that organizations can stay in forever. So what he sort of responded to that was, let me be clear, co-management can absolutely be your permanent destination. So Microsoft are not getting rid of SECM in any way, shape or form. They understand organizations have made heavy investments and it's been around for a long, long time. 
and there's a lot of skills within that space and they don't want to cut it off. So what they're really just saying here is, regardless of whether or not you enable co-management, this can be your destination for, for absolutely forever from that point of view. You can transition all the way to cloud native entirely, or you can just stay in that hybrid co-management approach. And I think that's really important for organizations to understand. Um, for those of you who haven't made, sort of started making that move, it's really, really time to start thinking about how co-management. And I think um, through COVID, through lockdown, through the hybrid working mandates that have come across the UK and sort of the rest of the world, I think we've understood you know, how much on-prem infrastructure is creaking at the seams when we're trying to support remote workers. So enabling cloud device management through code management is going to start helping you alleviate that as well as to give you a future roadmap and a transition plan to move into as well. Um, the data analysis and the data visibility is so much better than sort of traditional SCCM. You get things like device health, application health, everything sort of associated to it as well. So it's a much simpler and cleaner model for people to pick up and understand from that point of view. So you don't necessarily need to be uh, an SCCM guru to, to fully pull out the reports because I'm certainly not and I still struggle with the SCCM uh, reporting functionality as a whole. Um, and then the final point I really just wanted to leave everyone in um, is effectively the majority of organizations utilize Microsoft 365, but they don't fully utilize their investments. So a lot of organizations may have things like Microsoft 365 E3 or E5, but they may just use it for the software, which is absolutely fine if, you, if you're happy with you know paying that kind of money just for software. Um, and I think public sector are really, really good at this, where they have to squeeze every penny out of every single investment they get. And I think everyone should sort of take a page out of that book to say, you're paying for Microsoft 365, the solution stack is absolutely massive, and you have the opportunity to replace existing solutions you've got in place um, and ultimately improve what you're doing along the Microsoft ecosystem. There's nothing wrong with putting your eggs in one basket associated to device management and Microsoft 365. Um, you just get more and more value when you start pulling all of these different solutions together uh, within Microsoft 365 rather than having them um, all sort of disjointed from that point of view. Um, so I really just wanted to finish on just saying, yeah, thank you very much. Really, really enjoyed this. Um, if you have got any questions, feel free to find them in. Uh, but apart from that, I will kick it over to James. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Dan. That was great. Um, yeah, we've actually, I've, I've, uh, I've received a couple of questions whilst you were talking there, actually. So I'll, uh, I'll file these over to you if that's okay. Um, right, let me pick the first one. Okay, here's a good one to start, actually. Um, with regards to workloads, what do you think, well, what do you recommend the first workload should be that, that an organization tries? Um, I think the first thing that most organizations should really start with is device compliance. Um, so device compliance incorporates a lot of things um, in terms of configuration, but to ensure you that you're building out the configuration of the devices correctly, you need to outline what your compliance settings need to look like. So yeah, do you need things like uh, BitLocker enabled? Do you need to make sure Windows Firewall enabled? Do you need to make sure the antivirus is on there? So once you've built out your compliance policies, that will give you a baseline of, okay, these are the things we need to tick off as we move into modern management. Um, and from there, you can take that and then port that across into things like resource access policies, endpoint protection, office click to run, client apps, all those sorts of things. So yeah, definitely start with device compliance and then build out a map from there. Perfect, thank you. And then following on to that then, having, having built that out, what do you see as one of the biggest benefits of co-management? Um, I think the biggest benefits is you get the benefit of continuously using and leveraging your existing investment within conflict manager with on-prem, um, but you get the benefit of ultimately everything that comes with cloud native services. So everything aligned to Azure Active Directory, conditional access, um, autopilot, everything to make your life a lot easier. Uh, and like I said, the most impressive thing for me is getting a real detailed view of your devices and how healthy they are. And you can rely that he that health to physical metrics, you know, RAM, CPU, disk space, et cetera, or ultimately start leveraging things like, you know, what applications are potentially causing slow boot times, what applications are falling over on a regular basis. Um, and then it just gives you a more proactive approach to how you're managing devices rather than what a lot of organizations do, which is reactive, uh, which is quite painful um, from a support desk. And I think we identified that quite nicely with a case study we gave there as well. Yeah, definitely, agreed. And I've got a final one here. Good question, actually, probably to finish with. Um, so with regards to SCCM, do you think that this will be disappearing in the future based on everything you've been discussing today? No, no. I think it's 
Microsoft's mandate, and I think, again, sort of based on the quote that Brad Anderson came out with, I think that was quite clear. Um, they, they don't want to get rid of SDCM. Um, certainly not in my lifetime anyway. Um, it's, it's definitely something they know there's a lot of skills in, there's a lot of investment in, they don't want organisations to turn it off because there's going to be a lot of things that Intune just can't do right now. You know, they're, they're not professing Intune to be uh, an input manager to be the be all and end all. It's it's a journey with everything that Microsoft do in very typical Microsoft fashion. They release something that's really cool. And then based on community feedback, they'll build more and more functionality into it. So, you know, certainly within the length of my career, I'm not expecting conflict manager to, to go away and I'm not you know, that old. Uh, so, so I definitely think it's going to be around for a very long time. And, and like Brad Anderson said, it's it can absolutely be a destination. It's, it's not a bridge. Understood. Perfect. Well, look, Dan, really appreciate your time. And likewise, everyone who's joined today, many, thank, many thanks for joining us. We'll, uh, we'll ensure this video is uploaded and available to share across all our, all our media streams. If you do have any questions, having heard this, or you've gone away and had a little thought about it, chatted with your teams and your colleagues, do reach out to Dan, do reach out to, to, to your contacts at Canwood, and we'll be uh, more than happy to, to, you know, to, to have a further conversation with you. But uh, with that, have a good rest of the afternoon, have a good week, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you again soon. Take care.